Peace Calvary and friends. This is Pastor Walton with this week's message. We praise God so much for your presence. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. The title of our series is Our God Wants Us to Know Him. Our God Wants Us to Know Him. And the title of this sermon, this is the second sermon in this series, is God Calls a Watchman. God Calls a Watchman. And the scripture is taken from Ezekiel, the third chapter, verses 16 through 21. And the word of God reads as follows. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, understanding, and the application of his word from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In the matchless name of our Lord Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. From this second sermon in this series entitled, God Calls a Watchman. God Calls a Watchman. And once again, the title of this entire series is, Our God Wants Us to Know Him. Our God is a personal and loving Heavenly Father, and He wants us to know Him. And certainly we know that the only way that we can get to know him is through his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But right now we will focus on this sermon, God Calls a Watchman. The content of Ezekiel is exile. A loving God has seen fit to allow his covenant people to be punished for their sin. The northern kingdom of Israel has already fallen. The southern kingdom will fall. Ezekiel was among the exiles. You would expect that he would be preaching revolution to his people, but instead his preaching was revolutionary. He preached that sin had gotten them there and only God in his time could get them out. The people of God had found comfort living in sin. They mistakenly believed that what Ezekiel preached was utter nonsense because of the promises of God in the past. But Ezekiel's message was that though God is a God of mercy, God is also a God who will not be ignored. And that is what they did. They assumed that they could do whatever they wanted because all of their behavior was covered by the promises of God that were given beforehand. Is there a parallel? I'm glad you asked. This is what it sounds like. Well, ain't nobody perfect. Well, if you knew my story, you would understand why I do what I do. Well, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And on and on it goes, even though the Apostle Paul in Romans 6 says that we should not continue in sin just because grace is available. What am I getting at? This is what I'm getting at. Holy living before God is the difference between a life of victory or a life of defeat. 
The reason some people never get what they pray for is because there is a secret sin that they won't let go of. Our mission here at Calvary is the Great Commission, and our vision is rebuilding families inspired by the story of Joseph. We're about helping people to be set free from what ails them, but we can't get cured of what ails us if we continue to go back to it time and time again. There has to be personal responsibility, and that is what we find in this text. Even though it is in the Hebrew Bible, it is still in the Bible, and we need to pay attention to it. Here's Ezekiel, having, lit, having had his life turned upside down in a moment, simply because God chose him for this assignment. God called Ezekiel before the foundation of the world, but made known his call to Ezekiel in the Babylonian exile. God was calling Ezekiel to preach God's word in a pagan and unbelieving culture to his covenant people, Israel. God was letting him know that God is God everywhere, not just in Jerusalem. Then in the second chapter of the book of Ezekiel, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, entered Ezekiel and gave him authority and power to do his task. And what was that? It was to preach against the rebellion of the house of Israel. Like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, Ezekiel was called to preach against rebellion. He preaches in the name of the Lord God. Hebrew scholar Robert Irvin writes that this is a title used 217 times in Ezekiel, only 103 times in the rest of the entire Old Testament. Lord translates the Hebrew Adonai, which emphasizes God's sovereignty. God translates Yahweh, the personal name of the God who made himself known and entered into covenant with his people. Now we're headed to our focal text, but, but two more important pieces of information in chapter two I want you to notice. Chapter two, verse five, calls a surviving Hebrew nation of Judah a rebellious house. This reference is used 11 more times, ending in the 24th chapter and the third verse describing Judah. Lastly, notice that in verse 10, of the second chapter, that when Ezekiel sees the scroll he is to eat and the words he is to proclaim, the scroll is covered not only on the front, but the back as well. And one theologian called this, and I quote, a departure from normal practice, signaling the distressing superabundance of the Lord's message, unquote. Ezekiel's primary task, is to prepare the exiles for the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He's lifted up in the Holy Spirit in chapter 3, verse 12, experiencing righteous indignation right along with God against sin. Then sits for seven days, the customary time to mourn for the dead, and is in shock before he speaks. Then God tells him what to say. And then in what comes immediately after our focal text, Ezekiel is commanded to go and shut himself in his house. While theologians have different takes on why this and the events following it, like Ezekiel having his tongue cling to the roof of his mouth and other things, it may, it may be that since that the people of God would not listen, God allowed Ezekiel not to be able to be among them and talk with them. We don't really know. But we find ourselves here in our text, and here in our text, we see the narration of this event in verse 16, where the Bible says, now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, and we'll just read this again for emphasis sake. Son of man, in verse 17, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them what? Warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked man from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. 
but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul again. When a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because you did not give him warning. He shall die in his sin and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, verse 21 says, if you warn the righteous man, that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because what? He took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. So these are the verses. It's narrated in verse 16, but in verses 17 through 21 of this third chapter, God Almighty speaks. The Lord God, Adonai, Yahweh, God speaks, the personal God, the God who wants us to know him, the God who wanted Ezekiel to know him, the God who wanted the people of Israel specifically, the people who were exiled to Babylon, the God who wanted us and them to know him. And God tells Ezekiel that he is to be a watchman. Now, the idea of a watchman is not new, and prophets were often called watchmen. Watchmen warned of danger. And Ezekiel was a priest called also to be a prophet. He was a priest and a prophet. He was already in a priestly family because his father, Buzi, was a priest. And so he was already in a priestly line, but he was called also, we see here, to be a prophet of God and to warn God's people. Well, what's the message? The message Ezekiel gave was one of personal responsibility. I hope that we all heard that, personal responsibility. The watchman had a responsibility, but so did the person the watchman warned. Now, how can we apply this to our daily lives? I'm breaking it down now in application and getting ready to get out of the way. Number one, nobody can get saved for you but you. You must be, according to John 3, you must be what Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. There is no way to get to know the Father but through the Son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The watchman, the preacher, the teacher, the pastor, the evangelist, the Sunday school teacher, the youth leader, the TV preacher, whoever that watchman is, delivers the gospel, but it is up to the person to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Born in Bethlehem, crucified on Calvary, raised by the Holy Spirit with all power in his hand. So that's my first point. Nobody can get saved for you but you. And then the second thing is, and this is a little rough, you have to excuse me, if you are in a place where you don't believe, for example, if you're in a church family or a ministry and you're in a place where you don't believe that the watchman that is there has been placed by God, you have a decision to make. People continue to think of the institution of church being their salvation. But church membership, my sister and brother, will not save you. Just because you are a member of so-and-so missionary Baptist or so-and-so Presbyterian or so-and-so United Methodist or so-and-so Pentecostal does not make you saved. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. People continue to think and some people hide out in the church. Some think of the institution of church being their salvation. But look at us now. It is not about the institution, although it has its place. And we have not been in church buildings, most of us, for six months or more. And so we know that God is speaking to us. 
And it's not so much about the church necessarily that you belong to, although that's important. It's about our relationship to who? To none other than Jesus Christ, the one who died for our sins. And if you have the right watchman, it is because that watchman is under the lordship of Christ and assigned to where they should be by God Almighty. I'm on my way to my seat now, but lastly, the last thing I want to share with you, and I just want to review my points. Nobody can get saved for you but you. And then the second thing is that you have to make a decision. Uh, if you're in a place where you don't believe uh, that the watchman has been called by God. Uh, and then the last thing I want to share with you uh, is that ultimately uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is the watchman. Uh, even if you are under pastoral leadership, uh, the pastoral leadership uh, that God intends, uh, you ultimately uh, are responsible for your own spiritual maturity. Uh, and that is the process of sanctification. Uh, remember justification. Uh, Jesus died uh, before we were born. Uh, regeneration. Uh, receiving Jesus Christ uh, as our Savior. Uh, we must be born again. Uh, and then sanctification. Uh, that's living that life in Jesus Christ. Uh, being a follower uh, and being a disciple. Uh, it has to be uh, a way of life, uh, a desire uh, to live holy, uh, to make right decisions uh, when the wrong ones uh, are in your face. Uh, how much uh, do you love the Lord? Uh, do you really uh, love the Lord? Uh, do you love him enough uh, not only uh, to let him save you, uh, but also uh, to let him lead you? Uh, my friend, uh, Ezekiel uh, acted out uh, a lot of the people's uh, disobedience. Uh, but as I close uh, this sermon today, uh, I don't see people uh, trying uh, to disobey God. Uh, I see you there. Uh, I don't see you trying uh, to disobey. Uh, but I'm glad uh, that I see you uh, trying uh, to obey God. Uh, your money's tight, uh, but you're still tithing. Uh, your money's tight, uh, but you're still giving. Uh, your health uh, is faulty, uh, but you're still trusting. Uh, it takes you a while uh, to get out the bed, uh, but you still get up uh, in God's power. Uh, somebody ought to say glory. Uh, somebody ought to say amen. Uh, your family uh, is falling apart, uh, but you still uh, have faith uh, that God uh, is able to do uh, the impossible. Uh, your mind uh, is worried, uh, but you still believe. Uh, I got a word for you. Uh, keep pressing. Uh, keep pressing. Uh, keep pressing. Uh, the apostle Paul said, uh, I press uh, toward the mark uh, of the high calling uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, he wants you uh, to get to know him. Uh, get to know him uh, and hold on to him. Uh, hold on tight. Uh, won't he do it? Uh, yes, he will. Uh, won't he open up ways for you? Uh, yes, he will. Uh, won't he close doors uh, that no man can open? Yes. Uh, won't he do it? Uh, yes, he will. Uh, say yes. Uh, say yes. Uh, say yes. Say yes. He wants you to get to know him. And the only way that you can get to know him is through accepting his son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior. If you want to receive Christ today, you can just simply repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, but I believe that you died on the cross to save me from my sin. And 
right now, I ask that you come into my heart. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, my sisters and my brothers, this concludes our time for today, but we just praise God and thank you so much. Ask that you would continue to keep us in your prayers. This is our 125th anniversary month, and we give God praise for that. We thank God for all that he has done. You're going to be receiving uh, information regarding our 125th virtual celebration. We've got some Bible studies also in the month of October. I just want to celebrate also today. we got Brother Chris Crane is playing. We thank God so much for him. Amen. I'm going to give the uh, benediction at this time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, the name of the most precious Holy Ghost. And the people of God said together, Amen. I love you, Calvary, and God loves you too. Amen. Thank you.